BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hi everyone, it's Robbie Savage here. Thanks for listening. We are recording these podcasts during the lockdown. While I'm sat at home and still lucky enough that a lot of my former teammates and opponents still talk to me. So I'm going to get them on the line and put your questions to them. Unless they've changed their numbers, of course. The player who has joined us started his career at West Ham before in 2000, making a record-breaking 18 million transfer to Leeds United. A few years later, after an impressive World Cup, he broke the transfer record again, signing for Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United for £30 million. At Old Trafford, he went on to win six league titles, the Champions League in 2008, a Club World Cup trophy and two League Cups. When he made his debut for England in 1997, he was the youngest ever defender at the time to play for the Three Lions. He won 81 caps and played at two World Cups, including scoring against Denmark in 2002. Heskey's on the near post. It's driven low. Goalkeepers don't work for it. And that's over the line. That's a goal for England. Rio Ferdinand has put England in front after just four minutes. Can I welcome... The legend that is Rio Fernand. How are you, Ray? Not bad. I'm a bit disappointed with the build-up, to be honest with you, but it's cool. <laughs> I didn't want to say, and in his illustrious career, he got one red card because of his awful decision to make an awful challenge late on against me in a game. <laughs> yep, that was part <laughs> of it. <laughs> Mate, it was, it was a red, though, wasn't it? You crazy. You're the only blemish on my blimmin' like, I can't believe it, man. I can't believe it. Do you remember that game, mate? You played in midfield, didn't you? Yeah, I ran you ragged all day. You couldn't, you couldn't get near me. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It was fine. But, but, mate, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I got sent off. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember when I, I looked? I had a cheeky look at the physio when you were when you were getting sent off, and I got stretched off. Do you remember? And after the game, I had a boot on, and you were going to try and kill me. In the I dress. tried to get out of the change room to get you. I thought this cheeky <laughs> cheeky man has took liberties. He's lied. He's walking around in the change room like there's nothing wrong with him and then he comes out in a boot, the cheek of it. <laughs> right. So, listen, Ray, your first question comes from our last guest, your former Manchester United teammate, Paul Scholes. I don't think you'll answer honestly. Who is the two-touch champion? Come on, be honest. We, we all know the answer. And secondly, other than me, who was your favourite person to pass the ball into midfield to? All the best, Rio. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Who was the two-touch champion? Scholes, he was top man, to be fair to him, yeah. But I used, obviously going out on a pitch, you want your creative players to be a full confidence. So I used to let him win most of the time in the change room before a game. So before a game, we'd play two-touch every single game, me and him. Our fires would be red. We'd look for a spot outside the change room in the tunnel, in the corridor, anywhere it was, and we'd play two-touch, just blasting the ball at each other. The, the levels, so if you wouldn't have been able to play. There would have been a lot of players... <laughs> Loads of players in there. If you speak to them now, say we said we couldn't, we couldn't get up and compete. Like uh, Tom, Tom Cleverley and Welbeck used to say, "Listen, we should watch and think." No, nah, no, nah, the intimidation levels are too much. <laughs> and the second part of that question, Ray, was who was your favourite midfielder to pass the ball out to? Michael Carrick. <laughs> 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 no, Scolzi, Scolzi and Carrick were just like. They're a defender's dreams, you know what I mean? There's players like them and then there's players like you that run away. It's just the difference is just unbelievable, do you know what I mean? Like you'd yeah. run away from the ball and didn't want it and then they'd, they'd come for it, come short and just... It could be a five or a ten yard pass but it makes it so much easier for you because I used to like to have the ball so... And I'd like to draw a midfielder to me. So if I played against you, I'd want you to come to me so that Skulls or Carriage could get free. And they just knew the angles to make. So I'd yeah. never be under too much pressure. They'd, they'd make the angle, make my pass and my life easier. Wow. So listen, mate, talking to Skulls here, I thought we may as well kick off with this one from Brendan Ashcroft. How good was Paul Skulls? Mate, he was just like a ridiculous player. Like, I always say this type of example. If, you, if, you had, if I had my last 50 pounds and I was going to back any person that I knew or anywhere, I, I thought, you know what, I need you to win this last 50 quid for me, to turn on that light switch over there that's 25 yards <laughs> away, he'd be the man I'd put the money on. 
He's he, part, he, had a, he had a radar boot. His boot was unbelievable. It was just like I'd I'd play him the ball right, and he'd he'd have his, he'd come to me on the half turn, just in our half, and I'd shout like something like Giggsy or Nani or Ronaldo or whoever it was, and he'd just take a touch and just go bang, and it just yeah. always on the money. Like it was just an, an amazing football player, and every day in training, one of the best, if not the best player in training. The way he spoke about that, Ray, in, in in the last podcast, where he would come and get the ball on the half turn, next touch, he'd look for Rude Van Nistelrooy because he said oh. Rude was his favourite striker to play with. Because Rude was always so Rude was like all he wanted to do was score goals. Rude, it wasn't he didn't care about any coming short and all that stuff. He'd do that reluctantly. His game was about goals and like. So Scolzi wanted to play that pass all the time. Waza used to want to come short to feet more often than not. So he, that, that, he, Scolzi don't mind playing that pass, but Scolzi wants to put some, he wants to take risks and play people in. So Rude was just like an amazing player. Like he had great timing. He wasn't as quick as someone like a Ronaldo or Luis Saha or someone like that, but he's timing and he just had it with, with, with Paul where Paul would get it, man. And, the thing is, you take a look before the ball comes, probably a second, half a second before the ball comes. It's almost like a, a taking a picture with a camera. He's seen the setting and it goes bang, just plays it blind and he, it's on the money. So we have to record questions really, on people's phones and he's the first one that was emailed to us at savage at bbc.co.uk. Hi Rio, Davey. I just wanted to know what your biggest high and the biggest low in football career was. And you've obviously had so many highs uh, and quite a few lows within football. Just wanted to know which one stands out for you and why. My biggest high would have been winning the Champions League in Moscow. That's like the top of the mountain for me. It's just like a feeling that I thought... I went to the semis with Leeds, got beat, got smashed by Valencia um, away from home 3-0 you know, and just thought, wow, this is going to be a very difficult tournament to even get near the final, let alone win it. So got got near a couple of times, Got I thought we had a chance with a couple of Man United teams, got knocked out. I mean, just thought, this is difficult got there, won it, and was just like, if you could tin that feeling and put it on the shelves, you'd be a billionaire. What is like, it was unbelievable. And then you've got... What about the lows? The lows would probably be getting banned um, when I got banned for all, for eight months for missing a drug test, um, especially when you prove your innocence and you prove there was no skullduggery or anything that was going on, um, but then you be, you're, you're, you're made an example of given that there were other people that had done very similar to what I'd done, if not exactly the same, and got a slap on the wrist at best. Um, so felt very much made to be a villain when I wasn't necessarily done it. I was stupid, I was naive, yes, but I wasn't a drug taker or by any uh, stretch of the imagination, which I proved with uh, all the tests and various tests you could do at the time. It went back from like for, for 18 months, actually. Yeah, they're, they're probably the, the, the highs and lows, if I'm honest. Uh, I think losing cup finals is always something that will, will never leave me. I could be sitting on a sun lounge or on a beach having the best holiday, the kids running around, my missus sitting there pouring me a drink. And then you get a, a, you, a memory of a game that you just got beat in the final. Well, you... when, when Messi got away from you for that head at Wembley, no? Yeah, I just, I mean, I couldn't believe it. Do you know what I mean? So... <laughs> <laughs> right, mate, your next question comes from Joshua, age 12. What was it like starting and finishing your career with Harry Redknapp? And what did he give you as a player? Um, it was very different, starting and finishing with him. I think when I started, he gave me the confidence that probably no other manager could have given me. It made me feel six foot seven, going out onto the pitch and thought I thought I was almost invincible. I thought uh, he allowed me to take chances. He allowed me to blossom. He allowed me to, to, to grow my confidence, um, make mistakes real, but don't repeat them. Um, never really battered me um, for mistakes. He just made me feel really, really at ease in a in a man's game as a kid, which I think is hard to do for a manager. Um, and then I went to to QPR. I probably regret going there now, if any, if I'm honest, because I weren't up to it anymore physically. My body was just was saying no. It was breaking down all the time. Um, I was running, looking over my shoulder, almost like that, in terms of will something break or will I pull a hamstring or whatever. And there was things obviously going on in my personal life and I thought it's probably a step too far. Yeah. But he was, again, he was great around that time as well with anything that happened with me. He was really good for me. Jordan Robertson wants to know, as an ex-West Ham player who knows and understands the club, what do you think has been the main cause of West Ham's downfall since the stadium move? And would you ever be interested in joining the club as a coach? 
Um, I think recruitment could have been better, but I think many clubs are in that position with West Ham. They spent a lot of money on people that probably have not given back the worth. Um, um, and I think that uh, my biggest thing for West Ham uh, is that I think that I look back at my time and why did I sign for West Ham? West Ham wasn't a fashionable club. West Ham wasn't the club to go to. It wasn't the club that was a breeding ground of young players. Hadn't brought a player, player through to play first team football properly probably since Paul Ince. Um, so there weren't really many reasons for me to go there. But what they, what they did create there is they created a, a, a vision and a pathway and a... And a a storyboard for the young kids to say that we're going to bring the academy back and we're going to make this the academy. We're going to make sure that we invest in young kids in and around the local area to come in and play for this first team. That's what we want. And so when I heard that, that was enough. That's all you want to hear as a kid. All you want to hear is that I'm going to have a chance to get in this first team and I'll, and you're going to be at the forefront of it, your, your, your age group. So Frank Lampard was a year older than me. His age group started and me and him came through first out of all of that group after they'd made that commitment to the young kids and... Once I heard that, I think that's what my West Ham need now. West Ham, West Ham haven't got that now. I don't see it now. Declan Rice has come through, yes. Um, but there's not enough. West Ham are in an area. It's a hotbed of talent. Like, it's a ridiculous area for talent. But all these kids are going elsewhere. Other parts of London, other parts of the UK. It, sh- it shouldn't happen. I think they need to pull it back and make a real effort, I think. You move from West Ham, record transfer to Leeds, and A.N. Emsley asks, Ray, which Leeds player players did you learn the most from in your short time at the football club? Um, oh, who did I learn the most from? I remember your debut. Do you remember your debut? Savage header again, mate. God, I snuck away from you. <laughs> I was at Filbert Street and I thought, if I, <laughs> I finished that game, we played... You know what? David O'Leary changed the formation, right? They'd never played three at the back in their life. I turn up because West Ham played three at the back. He thought, big money signing. and got to make it easy for real. We played three at the back. Destroyed the whole team. Everyone was confused. We got beat 3-1 three, <laughs> three by an unbelievably good and aggressive Leicester team. And I thought to myself, West Ham won that day. And I thought, have I made the right decision here? West Ham went above Leeds in the league. <laughs> I thought I've, 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 made a, I've made a right pig's ear of this, but it turned out all right. And who did I learn most of about in, in that team? Um, I think the humbleness of someone like Lucas Radibi was, was yeah, really yeah. important. It was a, I came in and within three months, I was given the armband that he had held for um, and done ever so well with before. And the way that it was handed over to me, I was, it was a bit embarrassing for me a little bit. And I thought it may be a bit soon. The manager saw it, the right decision, and he, the way he just took it, and with, I don't know, there was just a, a way of and calmness and respectfulness, and just the humble way that he, this guy was, man, always with a smile, just was something that I did take away from 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 him, definitely, especially becoming a captain. And another Leeds fan, Tom, wants to know how did you handle the emotions of a tricky transfer between Leeds and Manchester United? I, I didn't see it like that. I, I didn't. I didn't understand or know the, the extent of the rivalry between the two clubs if, until I signed. Until I signed for for Man United, I didn't realise at all. Um, my whole me- mindset was strictly: I want to play for Man United because that's the place where I believe I've got a chance of winning trophies. So, um, and then I signed, and then it all just kind of it was like lighting lighting. <laughs> A bonfire, really. It just went off. It was crazy. The police... Like grease, like grease lightning in that suit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, like the, the, act, the, the police in Yorkshire rang me, just said, don't come back for a while and stuff like that because it was just crazy. So I didn't realise it was such a heated rivalry, if I'm honest. Liam asks, what was your first meeting like with Sir Alex Ferguson? As a young centre-back, I idolised Rio and Vidic and what made them work so well together. So what was your first meeting like with Sir Alex? Um, it was when I signed, really. It was just like, I was there with my mum and that. And, and, and he, I remember he said to me, like, well, here, son, good to see you, blah, blah, blah. He made a joke about my suit I was wearing, etc. cetera. And um, I remember him saying to my mum, like, I overheard him. I pretended like I didn't hear, but he said to my mum, he doesn't look happy, the boy. Is he all right? And my mum was like, he just wants to get playing. He don't, he, all this, he doesn't really want to do. He just wants to get playing, all these pictures on the pitch and that. He wants to go and play. So... Um, he just, I just, he had an aura about him where he just felt so scared to do or say or do the wrong thing at the beginning, especially. And he said hello to you, and you just sometimes you uh, you wouldn't know what to say. You say, "Yeah, all right, boss," and you, you think to yourself, "Is should I say boss? 
should I say Gaffer? Should I say Sir Alex? Should I, you don't know what to say. It's like being a kid with a headmaster at the beginning, especially. And all you want to do is please him. So um, he, was, he was brilliant. And the next bit of the question was about me and Vidic, was it? Yeah, what made you and Vidic work so well together? Um, I think we, we quickly understood each other's best attributes and played off of them. I think we were, he understood that I was the one that wanted to sweep up behind more often than not and nick in front and nick things and stuff. He was the more the aggressor who wanted to go and go out for headers and, and be combative, combative in the box. Um, he dominated the penalty area in that sense. But And what was great about it, that we both could then bring a little bit of what the other could do into their game as well. Um, if, if a centre forward or a winger wanted to stand on me for a few minutes or a few parts of the game and said to the keeper, launch it over here, I was quite happy doing that. And if he would, then he would sweep up behind and we, we could both then alternate in terms of our duties. It was, I think that's a good, big part of it, being able to appreciate your partner's best attributes and play off of them. Tom wants to know, does Real think the Man United squad of 2007 to 2011 is underappreciated? Yes, I think that team goes into any era and competes 100% and comes out with, with trophies. I think that what we've done over that sustained period of time, I'd probably say only Liverpool probably done that um, in the 80s with a team that they had in terms of back-to-back successes, three on the bounce. Um, but along with them three on the bounces, I think two Champions League finals, uh, League Cups, etc. So FA Cup finals. like So that, that, that team... Um, the difference between that team and the and, and the the ninety nine team is especially is that that team is they won the treble that one season they were the best like they've not this unheard of what they've done they're phenomenal um, but over a period of time I think we 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 done a bit more. Ruben wants to know if you could take one player from the post Ferguson era and place them into that two thousand eight squad, who would it be? Oh, good question. Um, who would it be? Um... Probably Pogba. Pogba? Yeah, Pogba. Because I think he, if, if you bring Pogba, the kid that I know, yeah, he, he comes in that team. He's 100% and, and enhances that team in time. Because talent-wise, he's a phenomenal player. I just think he's very unlucky that he's gone into a team that isn't like the team that I, I was in. Um, he's, he's gone into a team that isn't ready-made and built for success. It's a team that's really relying on him to bring that and to make that team successful around him. Um, and I don't think the pieces were put in place for him to for, to achieve that. Um, I think I think if he's honest, he'd probably say to himself, "I haven't done what I would would have liked Paul Pogba to do." He's had injuries as well, but at the same time, I, I, you need other parts of the jigsaw to be able to achieve stuff as well. Matthew Holland asked, "Who was physically and skillfully the hardest player you ever played against?" Mm, physically. I tell you, he was a beast, Adriano. Oh yeah, Inter Milan, oh, mate. Inter Milan. He played against him in the Champions League, mate. He, he didn't really do much in the game, but a couple of times you get near him, you can feel the power. You know, like you stand next to a car and you can just someone revs it up, and you think, oh, he's, <laughs> like, he's like he's like that. You think, whoa, he like if he gets going here, it's over. So um, yeah, Adriano was a mad powerhouse, um, skill wise. Uh, who had mad skill? Messi, man. Messi's got crazy skill. Um, Thierry Henry had skills. Yeah, the obvious players. Mate, um, the goal nine yards tweeted in. It's quite a good question, this, Rick. Does Rio feel his label as ball playing takes away credit from his actual defensive abilities? Maybe sometimes, yeah. But I think the people that know the game, I think, understand they, they, especially the players I played against and, and with, probably they know I could do both sides of the game. I don't think you get to the top and you stay there for a long time without being able to do both parts of the game. But you stayed on your feet, didn't you? You never dived in. Yeah, I, I, in terms of like the the, the, the laundry ladies, you should say, Rio, we might as well not even wash your shorts. Just put them back <laughs> on the peg. Because I never sli- I never done slide tackles really unless it was last, last, last resort. And I thought, I always think if you're slide tackling, then you've done something wrong. I did a lot wrong. <laughs> so you was doing stuff wrong every minute of the game, man. <laughs> but in, in, in my position, that's what I always used to think, and that was in my, that was always in my psyche. That was always in my mindset. If I'm slide tacking, or if I'm, if I come in the screen late on match of the day, slide sliding from somewhere, I've made a mistake somewhere down the line before that, and so I don't know. A lot of people talk about John Terry. Oh, he's a he's a diehard big defender. Wants to put his head on the ball, all that type of stuff. 
uh, and they forget that he actually could play with his feet as well. And I think probably that happens to me the other way. Lee Turner, did you turn down any big offers while playing for Manchester United? Um, yeah, I had, I had offers from Spain and Italy. Uh, you know you know what it's like, Robbie. Your agent comes to you and says, you listen, would you be interested in going anywhere? I've had the phone call from San. So, no, it didn't get to a place where they bid because obviously I just kind of said no to all of these different opportunities that come my way at the time. So... But yeah, going to Spain and to, to Italy was was opportunities that were, would have been there if I'd given it the green light. Because your game, the way you played, mate, you watched, you watched La Liga, you watched Serie A, you would have been like a Rolls-Royce back there. Listen, you were a Rolls-Royce in the Premier League, but you know, in, that, in those leagues, you, know, you would have been, it would have been comfortable for you, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I think that because them leagues played slow and I could have probably gone through the gears a little bit, I'd have stood out even more over there. Um, especially when I got the ball. And it would have improved me probably going to Italy as a defender as well because the way that they set up, you have to defend properly over there and you can't take chances and a lot of their stuff is about defending. But that's probably... I don't regret not going there, but it's something that I would like to have, have done. But the, the, diff, the problem is is that I'd, I'd worked so hard all my life to get to a point of being able to compete to win. I'd got there. I couldn't, I couldn't risk going somewhere else and, and maybe having a year or two where I didn't compete. Rhys Lewis asks, would Real take a job back in the United setup somewhere, director of football or with Carrick on the coaching staff? I think he is made for a job at United, says Rhys. Listen, I, I, you can never say never. I think Manchester United holds a place in my heart, same as West Ham as well. Um, and if opportunities come, uh, I wouldn't say no to anything. I'd always have the conversation and then we see where it goes from there. But if I was on the coaching staff, they'd be winning again, trust me. <laughs> 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 Swass Red tweeted thoughts on a Man United future Manchester United side. If you were if you were the director of football making decisions, who would you be looking at? I would probably go for Sancho, Koulibaly and Sol Nuguez at Atletico Madrid. Yeah, what about so Harry Kane? Harry Kane's been linked, hasn't he? He's yeah, yeah, money, I think he? Harry Kane's been linked, but if I was going to be pushed on an attacking player, I'd still go for Sancho. I think he gives you that little bit of imagination I think he gives you that little bit of spice that they haven't got at the moment Rashford when he's fit I think he's going to get you 25 goals a season as a number nine Marshall chipping with 15 plus um, and Sancho adding that extra little bit of someone who can draw probably they, I think having that someone that can draw two or three players to him out of position giving other players space is what Man United have missed for a while I didn't realise this as well. So Jack asked Rio, realistically, if Manchester United signed Sancho, would you give him the number seven? Ronaldo is the last player to have worn it and been a success. Um, yeah, I would. I think I think he's that type of character as well. He's got that. He's got a, an arrogance about him. What you want on a football pitch that he would embrace that. So uh, yeah, I'd give it to him. I'd put that pressure right on his shoulders. <laughs> this this is a good one. You, you, you don't have to answer it, Phil. When David Moy showed him and Vidic tapes of Phil Jagielka for training purposes, how much restraint did it take not to smash the VCR over his head? <laughs> the VCR did get smashed. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. No, no, no. That, that's like a, I don't know what that is, where that came from, to be honest with you. That's not something that never happened. Um, really? Like, listen, Phil Jagielka was a, was a very good player. I'm sure he wouldn't have shown us pic, uh, videos of, of, of Phil, of how we should be doing this and that, but... No, I don't know where that came from. That was just like, that's like some mad, mad tale that's come out of nowhere. Someone's dreamed it up and it's become a great meme. Jack from Manchester um, asks, if Although, you could go back... Although, to be fair, Sav, we did have some heated discussions, if I'm honest. There were a few heated meetings between myself, Vida and was there? David Moyes. Yeah, just because we didn't agree on certain things and there were certain ways that things were being done, set-ups um, from a defensive perspective, etc. He He wanted certain things... Um, we didn't really agree with certain things he was saying. And, but that's football. And I, th I think David Moyes would probably have, have had that before with many different players. So we wasn't the first and I'm sure we won't be the last. Um, Jack from Manchester asks, if you could go back and replay one game in your career, which one would it be and why? It would Not be... the one against Craig Bellamy in the derby where he ran away from you twice, no? Oh, the one that we won. That one we won. Oh, all, um... right, all right, all right. <laughs> Um, I'd probably you wouldn't have done that when I was in my prime trust me alright I'll let it go um, I was actually injured before that game <laughs> um, <we, laughs> no nah, um, I'd probably play the Champions League final at Wembley we got embarrassed that night they, they were the best club team I've ever seen Messi adding that sprinkle of mag that magic on the on already a great team full of like probably 
three or four of the FIFA best players in the world at the time were in that team. So that game would be nice to be able to replay and, and come out with a different scoreline of us winning would be nice. I'm an Arsenal fan, but always had great respect for real, says Dave Lawrence. If you could play with any centre-back in history, who would it be? Yapstam. Yapstam? Yapstam, because I think he'd have suited me the way Yapstam played. Another one who's aggressive, um, powerful, um, and I would have just been able to, he'd have made me look as good, if not better, playing the way I do alongside someone like him. I'd have had more, I think, a bit even more freedom to come out with the ball as well. So I asked um, Michael Owen and Scorsi, Ray, what would your ultimate five-a-side team be made of the players you played with? And the team has to include yourself. All right, me? You don't need a keeper, do you? Rush goalkeeper. Yeah, you need a keeper, yeah. All right, Edwin van der Sar, myself, Ronaldo, Scolzi, Gerard. Gerard. Yeah. Gerard. Yeah. You've got some big hitters missing out there, mate. Yeah. Uh, it's Gerard or Lampard. It's that old conundrum again, isn't it? Gerard or Lampard. I'm not sure, but I'd go probably Gerard because it's a small pitch, a bit more dynamic, maybe. So here's a question, mate. It was an audio question sent in. Right, boys. Question for you both: Do you both believe that you could have done better for your international teams? Go on, and you go first. I think I could have. I retired at thirty, didn't I? I was, you know, John Toss. I was manager. You know, I was you know, a bit hasty in retirement. So, yeah, I could have done better, of course. I could have had a longevity. Um, you know, I didn't agree with some of the things the manager was doing. Uh, I was the, 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 the spokesperson, the dressing room, you know, with, with probably more senior pros than me, but they let the, me take the burden on my shoulders and I didn't play for Wales under John Sarshank. So, you know, so I could have probably done a lot better and I regret it, Ray, of course I do. You know, in the previous pod, you know, scores, he said he retired He retired at 29 and to this day probably regrets it. You know, you played 81 times. I think the question, could you have done better, do you think? I'm not so sure. Is that You could have, could you? I think as a team, yeah. Um, even yeah. even as an individual, I think our team, I don't think, was ever set up for us players to, to, to be able to prosper, if I'm honest. And, and that's not shirking the responsibility or anything. I just think our team, If imagine if our team had played with a three-man midfield. Oh, yeah. Because we had Michael Owen and, and Rooney, the managers we had thought we couldn't play with a three-man midfield because you could, you had to have two up front. So they played four four two. So we were playing with like rigid four four twos, which didn't benefit any of our players. Didn't benefit Stevie. Didn't benefit Frank. Scolzi could have played in a four because he'd done it for Man United, but Wayne Rooney and Owen had to be in the team. And I understand they're two great players, but sometimes for the benefit of the team, you've got to sacrifice someone somewhere. Who it would have been, I don't know. That would have been the hard part. And I don't think the managers were willing to, to, to make that call of sacrificing anybody because we had such huge names. Like if we play a three in midfield and three up front, for instance, or three, three in midfield like a diamond with two up front, you could still play that. But then Bex doesn't get in the team maybe because he plays right midfield and he's the captain. So... There's so many different conundrums for the manager to think about, and that's probably the reason, one of the reasons why it would have took a really strong manager to be able to do that because they'd have had to take, he'd have had to withstood some backlash because a certain player or players would have had to been on the bench. Sean Smith moves on to that point, Ray, and says, "You know, England failures at major tournaments must still hurt with the players you had." Yeah, definitely, because the players we had, if you look around at all the other squads at that time. We probably had five or six, maybe seven players who could walk into every other team. Um, like every other team, we had world-class players. Probably, if you go through them, you had like Bex, Scolzi, at the time Michael Owen, uh, Stevie G, um, Frank, um, JT, Ashley Cole. Do you know what I mean? These are like Sol Campbell. These are all world-class players. Do you know what I mean? So... It's just that them names, when they go on the sheet, if they're not put in the right right way, the right formation and given the right way to go out there and play, it doesn't matter how good they are. Eddie asked, please ask Mr Ferdinand to name his best ever Premier League back four in positions and you can include yourself. Premier League back four? Whoa. I'll have to go with right back Gary Neville. Vidic was an unbelievable partner for me, my best partner I ever played with, so I'm going to have to steer with him. Um, and left back, wow, left back, hard man, Patrice Evra and Ashley Cole. Patrice was better going forward, Ashley Cole was better defending. Um, if I could have a mix of both of them, you've got your man. But you can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go with Patrice. 
Because we're an attacking team. Luke Ashenden, which aspect of your game do you wish you'd been better at? Well, you have you are very good at everything. If there's one aspect of the game, Ray, mm-hmm. which one did you work on more than most? Do you know what I mean? Which was the aspect of the game you worked on? When I was younger, I'd done one-on-ones loads. 1v1 really? all the time, yeah. It's the hardest thing to do as a defender because you, wow. you, because 1v1, you're leaving yourself exposed for criticism. You're getting exposed for, to, to being humiliated in front of the team, etc. So I'd do one on Harry Redknapp made me do one-on-ones all the time, twice a week um, for, for years. Wow. Um, and I used to go out and head a ball because I never, because I was a midfielder as a kid, I never headed the ball really. So I went centre back and I was like, heading the ball weren't what I was about. So I had to learn. So on a windy day in, in, in February, in January, December, like Frank Burrows, the coach, Welsh guy, actually. Do you know, I remember he used to be a yeah, coach yeah, at Swansea. Yeah, yeah. Frank Burrows used to go outside with two bags of balls, call one of the young goalkeepers out and say, launch every ball down the middle of the pitch, out of your hands, off the floor. And he used to stand there where the centre forward would stand and he'd say, Rio, just jump through me. And he'd oh. stand there and I just have to go run through him and jump through him. He used to be a heavy, whole, like, hardened man he was. Just go, bang! And I used to have to get up. I'd miss loads. And it, used, it took me, I used to think, oh, I'm never going to get the hang of this. And then in the end, after all them years of practising, um, it became second nature. But I think, yeah, I was always one that was always wanting to work hard. I think defending crosses is something probably that's not done enough for young kids now. I see so many goals conceded nowadays when I watch games because body positions are wrong. Um, looks like players, certain players, centre halves, especially, haven't been taught how to position themselves when the ball's wide to see ball and man, so stuff like that. The basics, them basics will never change. So you're talking about young players there, Ray, and people what might not know this, but I've got an under-14 side and you know I've got players from all around Manchester and one of my players was, was struggling, you know, he was he was taking the wrong paths and you know, you were in Manchester, you just done a, uh, you know, um, your, your agency just done a huge deal for a Premier League player and you took the time out of that meeting to give advice to one of my youngsters, you know, who was maybe had, you know, associated himself with the wrong friends, you know, taking, you know, the wrong decisions. And you sat down with him for 20 minutes, you know, and, and tried to give him some guidance. You know, what advice would you give to, you know, players now with ability who might be, you know, going in in, in the wrong pathways if they want to be a footballer? Yeah, I remember you ringing me about that as well. And I, I, I always just think about if I was wished... Like if I was in that position of a young kid and I was went that going down the wrong road, that if I could have that chance that someone who I may have looked up to, or I've seen walk the path that I've walked before, would be able to give me a little bit of time and 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 try and educate me a little bit and and to get back on the right path, I would I would really have appreciated it if I had to go down if I needed that. So I'm always mindful of that, and to do that isn't a big thing for me. It's twenty minutes out of my day. Um, and you just hope that it's not a waste of your time. You just hope that these kids take the the, the information on board and that they make a big, big um, decision in their life to go the right way. And I think the biggest thing I can say for a young kid is to dream like all of us did, have a big dream, but then work out the pathway. Um, and to be a footballer, it's difficult to do it. It's hard. You've got to be dedicated. But there's a lot of people that can tell you these are the path, these are the steps you need to take listen to them and try and then live that through your life. And there are going to be moments where there are people are going to offer you to make decisions to go the wrong way, but you've got to be strong enough to say no. And I think saying no and people ridiculing you for that and taking a mick out of you for that, in time, they'll be the ones patting you on the back and saying, you know what, this is my, what a man. And when you're taking them to cup finals where you're playing or you're taking them to different parts of the world where you're playing, they're the people you're going to bring and they're going to go, you know what, so happy you didn't... Didn't, didn't listen to what I was telling you that rubbish at that time and you've gone and done what you do mate. they're the people that you'll sit with when you're 45 like I will and I do who you're all, you're all reminiscing about your old times it was great advice man that you know that youngster now he kicked on he kicked on he was magnificent he listened to you you know he obviously took on board what you said mate and he was so grateful you had his mum on tea so it was amazing gesture mate next question Nathan Scott Pearson if you could work under one other manager Step for Sir Alex, past or present, who would it be? Pep Guardiola. Would it? Yeah, I think he's just like, the way that he coaches would have suited me perfectly. I'd love to have played under him in the way that you you got to, you start the attacks. I mean, I used to come off the pitch sometimes with, and me and Vid, Vid, Vidic would have been walking down a tunnel and we win three or four nil and I'm I'm fuming and he's going, Rio, what's wrong? I said, I ain't touched the ball. 
I ain't bloody touched the ball. What's going on? And you go, yeah, we won three or four nil. What are you talking about? It's happy. We're happy. We've got nothing to do. It's fun. I said, yeah, but I'll come to play football, mate. I don't want to just stand there. So in Pep's team, it's all about building from the back and dominating possession, having loads of the ball. I would have loved to have played. I would love to sit in a change room with a fly on the wall and just listen to him. You mean, you mentioned you mentioned the tunnel there. You know, a couple of questions left. You mentioned the tunnel. Just tell all our <laughs> listeners, just tell once and for all what really happened in the tunnel when, you know, half time, when you've run off, nudged me, I've chased you, battered you. And then you've needed Rooney to come and fill me in together. I'll let you tell it the real story if you want. But I got sent off, as we spoke about earlier, at, at, at Blackburn. And then we played at Old Trafford after. And I remember running towards the dodge, walking towards the tunnel. And you just, at half time, and all of a sudden, from behind me, I just felt this big push. And I went like <laughs> that. And I was like, Ooh, and you ran past. And I thought, wow, I chased you down the tunnel. <laughs> I remember chasing you <laughs> and just jumping on you in the tunnel. And I think, I think Smudger, Alan Smith jumped in as well and the security kind of pulled us off and it was just like, wow. But they're the days, weren't they? Good days, man. And look at us now. Oh, they were good days, man. To be fair, mate, it's amazing to think that, you know, I went to your, you know, um, your wedding to Kate, you know, and I was privileged to be there, mate. And who'd have thought that, you know, your only red car was against me. You bat- I battered you in the tunnel. I'm, I'm at your wedding. <laughs> I'll let you keep going with that one. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Man, there's just, there's just a couple more quick fire ones. Stephen Martin, best car you've owned? Aston Martin Vanquish S, unbelievable car. Mate, training. I've got to say, mate, just training now because you are. You, listen, you know you're such an athlete. We watch your training now. You know you've got your own YouTube fitness channel. Um, what inspires you now, mate? Because you're looking absolute great shape. What's the difference now in training compared to when you played? Uh, I don't run anymore. I just do fitness stuff in the gym. I do lots of weights and I do some hit sessions in the week uh, that we're doing on the on our YouTube channel, Ferdinand Fitness. But it, what inspires me, if I'm honest, mate, is I, I, I want to look good and feel good in yourself, like everyone. But I've got three young kids who me and Kate want to leave an impression on and, and them understanding that part of a lifestyle, not just part of just wanting to be fit, part of your lifestyle is moving and get moving and getting working out. And so us just going in there, rather than having to tell them all the time, you should be fit, you should do this, you should do that. Kids often learn from just watching and hopefully that will rub off on them and they'll think that physical activity in your daily routine is part and parcel. Last question, mate, now, as from me. Looking back on your career, if you were starting out right now, what is one piece of advice you would give to a young Rio Ferdinand? Outwork everyone in the training ground. Go in there every day and be the hardest worker. Be diligent with all of your preparation and recovery and and give everything you've got to this game. Listen, mate, it was an absolute pleasure to speak to you, mate. Thanks so much for taking the time. Just before you go, though, on the next podcast, mate, we're speaking to Jack Wilshire. So the way we start the next pod is I want you to ask Jack Wilshire one question. We'll play it to him at the start of the next Ooh. pod. Um, without injuries, Jack, where do you think you could be now? And what do you think you could have achieved without injuries? And as a second part of that question is, your career hasn't probably gone where you expected it, people expected it to go. Is that down just to injuries or something that's gone on that we're not aware of? Brilliant, mate. Mate, Ray, that's it, mate. All right, mate, top man. Really appreciate Ray, it, guys. Brilliant, mate. Ray, top draw, mate. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Keep an eye on social media for other players we are speaking to in this series for your chance to ask a question. The Savage Social is a Shooting Shark production for BBC Radio 5 Live and BBC Sound. BBC Sounds. Hi there, Ellis James and John Robbins here. Due to being such hard work socially, John Robbins has been living in self-isolation for most of his life. And now, due to the spread of COVID-19, the rest of the world has joined me. And that means Ellis too. So, as we batten down the hatches and practice social distancing, we bring you Ellis and John, the isolation tips. Armed with two USB microphones, patchy broadband and state-of-the-art duvet soundproofing, we will keep you company throughout these unprecedented times. Ellis James and John Robbins. 
Robbins, The Isolation Tapes. Available on our usual show podcast feed on BBC Sounds right now.